This week on Maker Update, a really wobbly table, Formlab's new automation ecosystem, a robot that shames you, a robot that inspires you, changing prices, and the zip tie tip omnibus. Hello everyone and welcome back to Maker Update. I'm Tyler Weingartner and I can assure you that no part of this episode was written by ChatGPT. Probably. Anyhow, I hope you're all doing well and staying creative. We've got an awesome show for you, so let's kick things off with the project of the week. There's just something satisfying about watching a robot do something that's uniquely human. Not human like tripping over a curb or rehearsing a speech to impress somebody, but the elaborate dance of perception and mechanical performance, like trying to balance a ball on a table. That's exactly what Aid Musa created with his ball balancing robot on Instructables. Of course, we have seen this sort of Stewart's platform before, like stuff made here's pool cue that won't let you miss a shot. But what makes this project such a delight is its approachability. Most of the parts are 3D printed, and everything else is hobby servos driven by a Palolo Maestro server controller. A Pixie camera module provides the feedback loop, and a Teensy 4.1 controls everything. You need to go through all the steps to teach the Pixie camera to track the ball and calibrate the platform, but Aid walks you through all of it. The other place that his write-up really shines is his explanation of all the maths that go into a robot like this. It's easy to get deep in the woods and leave most of your audience behind but he does a great job of explaining the concepts of inverse kinematics and PID tuning. He even has a second video that shows different PID tunings and their outcomes. Like what happens when the robot accounts for the ball's position, but not its velocity, or its velocity, but not its position. I think my favorite is when it overcompensates just slightly, which creates this constant swirling of the ball. It's not stable, but it sure is cool looking. On his Instructable, you can find two separate videos about the project, a full bill of materials, 3D printing files, code, and plenty of photos and diagrams illustrating the build and the math that went into the design. If you've ever wanted to create your own one of these, it looks like everything you could possibly need. Time for some news. Two weeks ago, Formlabs announced their automation ecosystem which is a collection of hardware and software tools used to industrialize your printing workflow. The most noticeable part is Form Auto, which can attach to modern Formlabs printers to automatically remove prints from the build plate and then deposit them into a basket for washing and curing. Then the build plate goes back into the printer for the next batch. There's also a larger reservoir for the resin, increasing volumes from one liter to five. And finally, there's a suite of software tools to manage a fleet of printers, create print queues, and check printing status. It's probably safe to say that this series of products isn't for most of us, but it's great to see Formlabs branch out into more automated printing as an incremental step between prototyping and factory manufacturing. More projects. The folks at the software company Monday have a problem. Open office floor plans can be great, but they can also be really disruptive. And this kitchen on one of the floors of their office is a hub of distracting conversations. So they got their Monday makers team to solve the problem with a passive aggressive robot to shush the overly loud folks so no one has to be the party pooper. The robot uses a microphone to determine the various noise levels and goes through different escalations depending on how loud you are. At its mildest, the eyes glow red and shifty, and at the most severe, it'll capture a picture of the offending blabbermouth and post their photo on monitors across the office. It's a fairly simple ESP32 project, but a great testament to how good design and a little bit of light and movement can really bring a project to life, or just make a good selfie robot. Caleb Kraft released a video on how he made this gorgeous CNC milled flame lamp that uses recessed lighting to illuminate this pattern of waves carved into these blocks of cherry wood. The design was made in Fusion 360 using a series of spline curves to make the waves. And once it was all cut, 
he added one of those LED neon silicone strips for the lighting before closing it up. Again, it's a great lesson in how a little bit of design work can really bring an ordinary piece into the realm of extraordinary. And finally, via the Cuddle blog, I learned about this simple walking figure automata by Federico Tabon. It's a pretty basic automaton, with one crank moving the feet and with the spring supporting the figure's head and neck to give it a lovely little bobbing motion. The best part of the project is the cuddle template he's provided that lets you fine tune the design for the thickness of your material and even the kerf of your laser. So much so that he doesn't even need glue to assemble the wood pieces. I also love this trick of using pencil graphite to lubricate the moving parts. You can get access to the template following the link in the video. Time for some tips and tools. Lately, we've been hearing an awful lot about AI being used in maker projects. And I suspect we're going to be hearing about it a lot more in the future. David Picciuto just released a video on how he used Midjourney, an AI-based art tool, to design a hand towel holder for his bathroom. After a few iterations on the prompts, he finally arrived at something he was interested in executing. It's sort of like having a robotic muse who's constantly trying to pull you out of your own mundane ideas to get way outside of your comfort zone. If you're in a creative slump, this might be more helpful to get you out of it than doom scrolling on Pinterest. From Maker's Fun Duck, we have a guide to reverse engineering e-ink price displays so they can display whatever you want. Plenty of retailers use these as low power in-store displays and there's no reason we can't get in on the fun too. Once you open up the case, you'll find a set of terminal pads. In the video, he solders on a few header pins to upload the new firmware, but it's easy to see the benefit of making a jig or using some pogo pins if you had to do a whole bunch of these. With the new firmware uploaded, he's able to update the display with an image file or a paintbrush tool or any number of predefined modes. This could be useful in a big organizational project. From Adafruit comes a new board called the Feather Scorpio. This is an RP2040 based microcontroller with all the usual feather bells and whistles, but with a special 2x8 header on the right side of the board. This board and the header make use of the RP2040's PIO mode, which allows for DMA control of up to 8 NeoPixel channels simultaneously. Plus, there's one other core on the CPU, so you can have that doing any computation for your display without interrupting the output. There's even an onboard logic level shifter, so it's sending the control signals at 5 volts. It's currently priced at $14.50, so it sounds like a lot of power for not much money. And finally, on Hackaday, I found this wonderful omnibus on zip ties by Al Williams. It's pretty safe to say these useful little connectors deserve a home in just about every maker's toolbox, no matter what you work on. This article has some fun history on the zip tie, but also a ton of helpful little tips, like a review of a zip tie tightening gun from Harbor Freight, or a tutorial on how to make tidy wire looms out of them. And you can even learn about some of the most expensive zip ties you can buy. There's a bunch of great tips in here. Check it out. For this week's DigiKey Spotlight, check out this older video on learning how to identify some of the most common schematic symbols. Schematics can be confusing enough on their own, but if you don't have a grasp of what the symbols mean, it'd be impossible to get a foothold on understanding it. What's worse, there are at least two major standards for the symbols. Fortunately, this video does a great job of breaking down some of the most commonly used icons for capacitors switches, diodes, and power sources. Give it a watch. All right, and that is going to do it for this week's show. I hope you enjoyed it and you aren't too concerned about our expressive new robot overlords. If you did enjoy the show, leave us a comment, give us a like, maybe hit subscribe. As always, huge thanks to DigiKey for making this whole show possible and you for watching. Take care. We'll see you soon.